Okay, it's all yours, Heather. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Municipal Candidate Information and Third Party Advertiser uh, session. My name is Heather Morrison. I am the clerk for Gray County. I wanna welcome everyone here tonight. Um, I hope it will be an informative uh, evening. We've got uh, several speakers that uh, you'll be hearing from tonight. Uh, the, the session is hosted by the clerks of Gray County and this is a fabulous group to work with. And uh, they've put a lot of work into this um, presentation tonight. And I want to introduce all of them to you. So we have uh, Raylene Martell from Gray Highlands. We have Brianna Bloomfield from Owen Sound. We have Lindsay Green from Southgate. Vicki McDonald from Hanover. Corinna Giles from the town of Blue Mountains. Margaret Wilton Siegel from Meaford. Genevieve Sharbuck from Meaford, or sorry, from West Gray. Do I get one wrong? Uh, we also have Jamie Eckensweiler from Owen Sound. We have regrets from Patty Cinnamon from Township of Chatsworth and Brittany Drury from the Township of Georgian Bluffs. Uh, also tonight, uh, we have Rob Hatton, Communications Manager from Gray County on uh, doing the recording, and Tara Warder, the Deputy Clerk from Gray County, she will be running all of the slides. I appreciate everyone attending today, putting your name forward or thinking about putting your name forward uh, for municipal government is an important decision, and there are lots of considerations related to that. To begin our evening, I'm going to thank um, municipal, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing representatives, Caitlin Reddick and Carol Suave. They are going to be uh, presenting some information to you from the provincial level. And Caitlin and Carol, I will pass the meeting over to you. Thank you. I'm just waiting for our deck to be up. Hi, Caitlin, it's Tara. I have it right here. And just one moment, please. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. So hello, my name is Caitlin Reddick and attending along with me today from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing is Carol Sobe. I'd like to thank Gray County for inviting us and for hosting this candidate and third party advertiser information session. Next slide, please. Thank you. These slides are meant to be a summary of some of the sections and should not be relied on for legal or official purposes. I do wanna stress that we are not lawyers and that you should always consult the legislation and seek legal advice when necessary. We will not be able to cover every aspect of the municipal election, but hope that this provides you with a better understanding of the process and legislation and improves and improves your comfort level. Congratulations for taking an interest in your community and in local government, whether you're interested in serving on a municipal council or on a school board or registering as a third party advertiser. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
This slide outlines some of the topics we want to cover during this session, the nomination process and how a candidate withdraws a nomination and also what happens if a candidate files a nomination and then changes his or her mind about which office they wish to run for, some key dates, who is eligible to run for a municipal office and a school board and who isn't, general campaign rules and election finances such as campaign spending limits, contribution limits, campaign expenses, borrowing, what expenses are exempt from the spending limit, finance surplus and deficit, financial reporting at the uh, at the end of the campaign period, compliance audits initiated by an application, penalties, general information about the voters list and rules about proxy voting, R rights of scrutineers at the poll, recounts and resources detailed on the second to last slide. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So you are considered running, running for a municipal office. Local government is the level of government that is closest to the people and is the most accessible and responsive to the needs of the community. You've made a decision to throw your hat in the ring or you're thinking about it and are curious to know how to go about it. Perhaps it's something you've always wanted to pursue or you want to make a difference or you're not happy with some of the decisions that have been made or you have a passion for politics. Regardless, it's a four-year commitment that will be filled with challenges, excitement, disappointments, hard work, and a great deal of satisfaction. Ontario's municipal governments deliver local services while the province establishes the legislative and policy framework. The Ontario government sets standards for many local services such as land use planning, building regulation, and social housing. And the province provides funding to municipalities for delivery of some services. The ministry also works in partnership with the municipal sector to support efficient and responsive local governments that are sustainable and investment ready. Local government is ch a challenging environment with high expectations and limited resources, aka doing more with less. There is a limited understanding of roles of council and staff. Government is like not, is not like other businesses. You can't make everyone happy, so council must make difficult decisions in the best interest of the municipality. Please note that the information um, about the role of council and staff and accountability and transparency can be found in the councillor's guide on the ministry's website. And the guide is an excellent tool that can provide you with a lot more information about how municipalities operate and how council and staff can work together in the best interest of the municipality. Next slide, please. Thank you. Municipal office eligibility and ineligibility. You must be an eligible vote elector, which means you must be able to vote. So the list above is a list that shows voter eligibility as well as ineligibility to run and hold office. You can only be nominated if as of the day you are nominated. You're qualified to hold that office under the act and are not, el are not ineligible under the Municipal Elections Act or any other act or otherwise prohibited by law to be nominated or to hold the office. Please note that the municipal clerk is responsible for setting up and running the voting places used in a municipal election. The clerk must comply with any provincial or local public health measures that are in effect and may also put in place additional procedures that they consider necessary for conducting an election. If you have questions, please contact your municipal clerk. If a municipal employee wishes to run for office on that municipality's council, they must take a leave of absence before filing their nomination form. For more information, please uh, referred to section 30, subsection four of the Municipal Elections Act. An employee of a municipality who wants to run for an office in a different municipality doesn't have to take a leave of absence or resign, but they should check with their employer to see if there are any policies that could affect them. Next slide, please. Thank you. School board trustee eligibility and ineligibility. Questions about school board eligibility should be directed to the school board secretary. Um, please note that if you're an employee of any school board and you wish to run for a trustee position on any school board in the province, you must take an unpaid leave of absence before you file your nomination form. If elected, you must resign from your job. You cannot work for a school board and be a trustee in Ontario at the same time. The following people are qualified for being elected as a school board trustee, you cannot be a clerk, deputy clerk, treasurer, or deputy treasurer of a municipality within the jurisdiction of the board, any person not eligible in the eligible to vote in the municipality. And um, the rest are in the uh, slide you'll see here. Also the ineligibility for municipal office is a judge of any court, an inmate of a penal or correctional institution under sentence of imprisonment. And lastly, a member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, a Senator and a member of House of Commons. Now I'm going to hand it over to Carol to continue. Hi, all right. So third party advertiser, 
I don't see myself on the screen, but there. Um, so a third party advertiser is an individual corporation or trade union that is registered in the municipality to promote support or oppose a candidate or yes or no answer to a question on the ballot. So a third party advertisement means an advertisement in any broadcast, print, electronic or other medium that has the purpose of promoting, supporting or opposing A, a candidate or B, a yes or no answer to a question on the ballot. Next slide, please. So only the following persons and entities are eligible to file a notice of registration. That's an individual who is normally resident in Ontario, a corporation that carries on business in Ontario, a trade union that holds bargaining rights for employees in Ontario. So regarding them, uh, item five in the ineligibility column, any group or organization that is not a corporation, this includes groups like associations or clubs that are not incorporated. Next slide, please. So the first day for filing nominations is May 1st, 2022. Note that this is a Sunday. So unless the clerk has policies in place to permit electronic filing, candidates may have to wait until Monday, May 2nd, 2022 to file their nomination. The last day and time for filing nominations for the 2022 election is on Friday, August 19, 2022 by 2 p.m. So just a clarification, the nomination filing fee is only refunded once the candidate submits a completed financial disclosure of all financial transactions made up to the date the nomination was withdrawn. The nomination day for a regular election is the fourth Friday in August in the year of the election. So in 2022, that is August 19, 2022. So with withdrawals of a nomination, local election policies may state a candidate must personally attend the clerk's office to withdraw candidacy. So if a candidate is in the hospital or incapacitated, this may not be feasible. If a candidate withdraws a nomination, they're still required to file a campaign financial statement covering all of the financial transactions made in the campaign. If they've not spent any money or raised any funds, they can click on the box, sign the form, and it's complete. If a nomination is withdrawn, the candidate is entitled to a refund of their nomination filing fee only after they file their financial auditor statement by the required deadline. An issue that's raised infrequently but is of importance nonetheless is what happens to a campaign which has been opened and the candidate decides to run for a different office. So in the candidate's guide, the ministry has provided a few examples showing what happens when candidates change their mind about which office to run for, or after they filed a nomination paper. Next uh, slide, please. So candidates must complete form one, which is the nomination paper and submit it to the clerk along with the applicable nomination filing fee. The filing fee is $200 for anyone running for the head of council and $100 for all other offices. The clerk must be satisfied that you are eligible to run in order to certify your nomination. The clerk can ask you to show identification or fill out an additional form to prove that you are eligible to run for that particular office. The nomination form must have an original signature. Now, if your nomination is not certified by the clerk, your name will not appear on the ballot. If there's a ward system, as long as you are eligible to vote in the municipality, you may run in any ward. If you do run in a ward where you do not live, you will not be able to vote for yourself as you must vote in the ward in which you reside. So in addition to the legislative requirements, each municipal clerk may establish their own local processes and procedures related to submitting a nomination. So it is important to contact the clerk so you understand the process in that municipality. Now the use of electronic filing for candidates and or third party advertisers is in the clerk's discretion. The clerk also has the authority to determine what methods could be used to file electronically. 
councils do not have the authority to order the clerk to use electronic filing. The clerk may permit a candidate or third party advertiser to submit an, ele uh, an electronic nomination at a time when the clerk's office is not open. So for example, on a Friday evening, by establishing conditions and limits with respect to electronic filing. This allows the clerk to ensure that all of the requirements of the nomination have been met. So that's the filing fee, the endorsement signatures before the candidate or third party advertisers campaign period begins. So even if the clerk permits electronic filing, all campaign documents require original signature. That's including the signatures endorsing candidates nominations where applicable. If electronic filing is permitted, it is the responsibility of the candidate or third party advertiser to maintain these original records until after the next regular election in 2026. The first day that a candidate may file a nomination or that a third party advertiser may register is May 1st. Next slide, please. So nomination process, 25 signatures required. Municipal council candidates are required to obtain 25 nomination signatures on form two. You'll find this in Ontario Regulation 10197. It provides an exemption to this requirement for candidates in municipalities with less than 4,000 electors. So the requirement for nominators to sign no nomination forms does not apply to school board candidates. Nominators can nominate more than one candidate and are not required to vote for that candidate. Nominators must meet the eligibility requirements of a municipal elector at the time they sign the nomination form. In a ward system, the nominator can be anyone who's eligible to vote in the municipality, not just the ward. So both the clerk and the candidate are entitled to rely upon the information provided by the nominator. So if the nominator did not meet the eligibility requirements when they signed the document, then they could be held accountable under the penalty section of the Municipal Elections Act. Next slide, please. So occasionally a candidate changes their mind and decides to run for a different office. You can only run for one office at a time. If a candidate files a second nomination, the first nomination is deemed to be withdrawn. If a candidate decides to run for another office and they've already collected the 25 endorsement signatures, they can use these endorsements for the other office. If a candidate decides to run for a different office on the same council or school board and both positions are elected at large, Everything from the first campaign is transferred to the second campaign and only one financial statement needs to be filed. Now, unless the candidate decides for a decides to run for a different office on the same office, on the same council or school board and one or both offices is or are elected by ward, the two campaigns must be kept, sep kept separate and two financial statements must be filed. Next slide, please. So registration of third party advertisers. Individuals, corporations and trade unions may register to be a third party advertiser. There's no registration fee for third party advertisers. A third party advertiser would register with the clerk at the local municipality as per section 88 subsection six. And this states an individual corporation or trade union may in person or by an agent file with the clerk of the municipality responsible for conducting an election, a notice of registration to be registered third party for the election. And the notice must be filed in the prescribed form and must include a declaration of qualification signed by the individual or by a representative of the corporation or trade union as the case may be. So in subsection uh, two of section 88, it notes also that a notice of registration may only be filed with the clerk of a local municipality. So once registered, they may advertise in support of or opposition to any candidate being elected by voters in that municipality. This would include council, trustee, and directly 
elected upper tier candidates. To advertise regarding questions on the ballot will require registration as a third party advertiser. For a regular election, the registration cannot be filed earlier than the first day of filing nominations and cannot be filed later than the Friday before voting day during the clerk's office hours. So section 88, subsection six, notes that once the clerk certifies the notice of registration, the individual corporation or trade union is a registered third party for the election. Third party advertising is geographically based and it's structured around the concept of influencing a specific set of voters in a specific location. Registering in the municipality where the third party advertiser hopes to influence votes allows flexibility to support or advocate against any candidate in that specific geography. So if any individual wants to influence voters in more than one municipality, for example, over the three municipalities covered in each specific school board trustee election, he or she would have to register in each of the three municipalities and conduct their activities as three separate campaigns. So also in, sub, in section 88, subsection seven, if the municipality is satisfied that there's been a contravention of the act, so then it can ask the third party advertiser to remove the advertisement or discontinue the advertising. I'm gonna hand over the next slides to Kate Lynn. Thank you. So, um, awesome, thank you. So third party advertisers registration is deemed to be withdrawn if they file a nomination. This means that their advertising campaign would automatically end when they file their nomination. If a corporation or trade union is registered as a third party advertiser, it would not be affected by a person filing a nomination as the person would not be the same entity. A third party advertiser and a candidate would need to be careful to distance their activities as third party advertising may not take place under the direction of a candidate. The existing campaign rule, finance rules would not change. Finances relating to a third party advertising campaign cannot be transferred to a candidate's campaign. The existing campaign finance rules would not change as a third party advertiser who withdraws and closes their campaign cannot transfer that campaign to someone else. To maintain financial transparency around third party advertising campaigns, the financial statements of advertisers who end their campaign early should reflect their finances as of the day the campaign ended. The registration period for third party advertisers runs until the Friday before voting day, October 21st, 2022, or the last day the clerk's office is open before voting day in a by-election. Next slide, please. Thank you. Contributions. Campaign accounts are are only required if the candidate or third party advertiser raises or spends money. So for acclamations and campaigns where no funds are raised or spent, there's no need for a campaign account. Trade unions and corporations are not eligible to contribute to camp candidates' campaigns, although they can participate in the election as third party advertisers or make contributions to third party advertising campaigns. Third party advertisers will generally need to follow the same rules for raising funds, campaign funds, and financial reporting as candidates for office. Municipalities must establish rules and procedures regarding the use of municipal or local board resources during their campaign period. This must be passed by May 1st in the year of the election. This will encourage accountability and transparency, so ensure that you are aware of the municipality's policy in this regard. The practice of municipalities of providing candidate contact information on their website is not a contribution. Generally, the same contribution rules will apply to third party advertiser campaigns as to candidates. Refer to both when the rules applies to both. Next slide, please. Thank you. Contributions from the candidate and their spouse are considered to have come from the same person and count against the self contribution limit. The rules for determining whether corporations are considered to be one contributor are clarified. If one corporation controls the others directly or indirectly, then they are considered to be the same contributor. If the corporations are owned or controlled by the same person or groups of persons, either directly or indirectly, they are considered to be the same contributor. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, volunteers. So the value of services provided by volunteers is generally not considered to be a contribution. Um, the next sentence I'm going to state is a question we get quite often. So uh, please keep this in mind. If a professional, example, a, an accountant or a lawyer volunteers to provide services for which they would be nor which they would normally be paid, the market value of the service must be recorded as a contribution by the volunteer and as a campaign expense. As mentioned previously, one only third party advertisers can accept contributions from corporations and unions. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. Camp campaign contributions are monies, goods, or services given to a candidate for his or her election campaign. Cash, cash contributions may only be accepted up to $25 and contributions more than $25 must be made by check, money order, or by a method that clearly shows where the funds came from. Fundraising functions are events or activities held by or on behalf of a candidate for the primary purpose of raising money for the candidate's campaign. The price of admission to a fundraising function is a campaign contribution and a receipt must be issued for the full amount. Receipts must be issued for every contribution and should contain the name and address of the contributor and the amount and date. Next slide, please. Thank you. The limit on contributions to any one candidate or the registered third party advertiser is $1,200. The individual contribution amount has increased from $750 to $1,200, but the aggregate amount of $5,000 stays the same. Since candidates and third party advertisers are required to inform contributors of contribution limits, you may want to include the limits on the receipts provided to the contributors. Next slide, please. Self-funding limits. Self-funding limit for municipal council candidates based on the number of electors voting for the office to a maximum of $25,000 per candidate. The formula for calculating the limit is $7,500 plus 20 cents per elector for head of council and $5,000 plus 20 cents per elector for council offices. The highest self-funding limit that anyone could possibly have is $25,000. If the formula works out to a number that is over $25,000, they still get the $25,000 limit. If the formula works out to less than $25,000, then they get whatever the formula works out to. There are no self-funding limits for school board candidates or third-party advertisers. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Carol to continue. Thank you. Just the next slide, please. All right, borrowing. Uh, while candidates can open their campaign account with their own funds, the candidate cannot loan funds to his or her campaign to kickstart it with the intention of getting it all back. The only way that a candidate can reclaim the startup amount is after the election campaign period ends and prior to filing the financial statement. The candidate or his or her spouse may be refunded any contributions from surplus. You can't receive a loan from family, family members or from any corporate accounts that you may have access to. The loan isn't considered to be campaign income and paying it back is not a campaign expense. But if you or your spouse guarantee the loan and the campaign does not repay all of it, the remaining balance is considered to be a contribution since the guarantor is basically providing the campaign the means to repay the loan. Keep in mind the contribution limit for the candidate and spouse if borrowing. Any interest that the campaign pays on the loan is a campaign expense. Next uh, file, please. slide, please. Thank you. So, the replacement value of goods retained by the person, individual, corporation, or trade union from any previous election in the municipality and used in the current election is considered a campaign expense. Uh, other contributions, like the value of sorry, the value of contributions of goods and services, audit and accounting fees, interest on loan under section 88, subsection 17, the cost of holding fundraiser fundraising functions the cost of holding parties and making other expressions of appreciation after the close of voting. For a candidate, expenses relating to a recount or a proceeding under section 83. Expenses that are relating to a compliance audit, expenses that are incurred by a candidate with a disability or a registered third party who's an individual with a disability, are directly related to the disability and would not have been incurred but for the election to which the expenses relate. So the cost of election campaign advertisement um, within the meaning of section 88 subsection three or third party advertisement as the case may be. So for greater certainty, the cost of holding fundraising functions does not include costs that relate to events or activities that are organized for such purposes as promoting public awareness of a candidate and at which the soliciting of contributions is incidental or promotional material in which the soliciting of contributions is incidental. Next slide, please. So candidates and third party advertisers should become familiar with campaign expense provisions. Campaign expenses are those incurred by the candidate 
or on the candidate's behalf during his or her campaign, or by a third party advertiser during their campaign. The nomination filing fee is no longer an expense and is not included on the financial disclosure form. Goods and services donated to the campaign are also expenses and must be reported. A receipt must be provided for fair market value. Only nominated persons and or third party advertisers can incur expenses during their campaign period. Payment of any campaign expense must be drawn from the campaign account and a receipt providing the details and proof of payment must be obtained. All expenses must be reported in the relevant financial disclosure form to be filed with the clerk by the candidate or the third party advertiser. So with respect to campaign inventory, if you ran in the last election and you wanna use leftover goods such as signs or office supplies, you have to determine what the current market value for those goods is and what it would cost if you were to purchase them today. These amounts are recorded as an expense. Conversely, if you end up with leftover inventory at the end of this campaign and it becomes your personal property, but if you wanna store them to use in another election, any costs for storage are not considered campaign expenses. Next slide, please. So the spending limit formula for candidates and the maximum amount for parties after voting day are set out in Ontario Regulation 10197. So the clerk calculates the spending limits twice. The first time upon a candidate filing the nomination form, the clerk shall calculate the spending limit based on the number of electors on the voters list as it existed on September 15, 2018. The second cal calculation is based on the number of electors on the voters list as it exists on September 15, 2022. This calculation must be provided to candidates on or before September 25, 2022. So whichever number is higher is the spending limit and the clerk's calculation is final. Next slide, please. So clerks will continue to provide estimates of the spending limits. Dates have been slightly amended with transition, transition dates for the 2018 election. Candidates will be required to inform the contributors of the contribution limits how much a contributor can contribute to an individual candidate's campaign and the aggregate limit on contributions to any one council or local board election. Spending limit to be provided by September 25. If a third party advertiser has registered in more than one municipality, each registration is a separate campaign with its own spending limits. So the campaign finance rules are generally the same for third party advertisers as they are for candidates. So they're subject to the same contribution limits and have calculated spending limits. This includes financial filing requirements, requests for extensions and records. Third party advertisers are also required to ensure contributions and expenses are tracked and accounted for. Proper record retention, proper direction is provided to those incurring expenses or accepting contributions on their behalf and that spending limits are adhered to. So next slide, please. So most expenses are subject to the spending limit. Those listed in, this, in the slide aren't. So these are expenses related to fundraising functions um, are exempt for, from the campaign spending limit. But in order to qualify as a fundraising function, an event must have the raising of money as its primary purpose. Campaign events at which incidental fundraising takes place do not qualify as fundraising functions. Similarly, a brochure promoting awareness of a candidate that con contains contact information to make campaign contributions doesn't qualify as a fundraising function. Expenses that were subject to the spending limit if incurred before voting day are not subject to the spending limit if incurred after voting day. Next slide, please. So third party advertisers will be subject to two spending limits, a general spending limit and a separate limit for expenses related to parties and expressions of appreciation after the close of voting. Ontario Regulation 101.97 provides the following formula for calculating third party spending limit. So it's $5,000 plus five cents per elector 
to a maximum of 25,000. The formula used is based on the number of electors entitled to vote in an election in the municipality. So the Municipal Elections Act also provides that the spending limit for parties and other expressions of appreciation after voting date be set at 10% of the general spending limit. This would be consistent with the spending limit in place for candidates. I'm gonna hand over the next slides to Caitlin. Campaign finance rules. So as a candidate or third party advertiser, it is important that you're fully aware of the responsibilities regarding election spending and accepting campaign contributions. A question that we are asked each municipal election is whether there is a requirement for every candidate to have a chief financial officer. The answer is no. We suggest that you familiarize yourselves with sections 88.8 .8 through 88.21 of the Municipal Elections Act and also the financial statements that you'll be required to file. This will help guide you in organizing your records and how they have to be reported. You are required under the Municipal Elections Act to keep accurate records and open a bank campaign bank account if you are spending any money or accepting any contributions. A bank account is not required if a candidate or third party advertiser does not receive nor spend any money. Next slide, please. Candidates and third party advertisers are required to, com to keep complete and accurate financial statements during the course of their campaigns. All contributions and expenses are to be accounted for and disclosed by the candidate on the relevant prescribed financial form. All candidates and third-party advertisers are required to keep all campaign financial records until after November 15, 2026, when a new council takes office. These rules apply whether you are elected or not. Next slide, please. Um, please store receipts in a secure place as they're valuable documents. Receipts must be signed by the candidate or his or her designate. It's good practice to have a receipt that is a multi-part form, one for the contributor and one or more for the candidate's records. Receipts should be sequentially numbered. Open a bank account which provides monthly statements and cancel checks. Produce duplicate deposit slips for every deposit, listing the names of the contributors and the amounts received from each. Maintain a petty cash fund to handle minor expenses and obtain invoices to support all payments from the fund. At any time, the cash on hand plus the total amount of invoices should equal the original amount of the petty cash. The fund can be replenished periodically by a check drawn on the campaign account in an amount equal to the total amount of the invoices. Candidates and third-party advertisers may find it useful to look over Form 4 for candidates and Form 8 for third-party advertisers, respectively, at the beginning of their campaign to give them an idea of what information will be required to report on at the end of the campaign. Requirements under the Municipal Elections Act to maintain records is until November 15th of 2023. Next slide, please. The period for third-party advertisers, as shown on the slide, is the period when the rules for third-party advertisers applies. In 2022, that is from May 1st, 2022, until the close of voting at 8 p.m. on October 24th, 2022. Third-party advertisers and candidates are required to identify themselves on signs and advertisements. For more information, please refer to the Municipal Elections Act for candidates, um, Section 88.3, and through third-party advertisers, Section 88.4. Next slide, please. Thank you. The broadcaster or publisher of a third party or candidate advertisement shall maintain records containing the following information for a period of four years after the date that the advertisement appears and shall permit the public to inspect the records during normal business hours. The name of the candidate registered third party advertiser, the name, business address, and telephone number of the individual who deals with the broadcaster or publisher under the direction of the candidate registered third party advertiser. A copy of their advertisement or the means of reproducing it for an inspection, a statement of the charge made for its appearance. Or a, yes, a statement of the charge made for its appearance. Sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. Financial statements. Section 88.25 of the Municipal Elections Act states that all candidates are required to file Form 4 with the clerk regardless of how much or how little they spend on fundraise. If you filed a nomination form, you must file a Form 4. This form is required even if you withdrew your nomination or were acclaimed. If you are registered as a third-party advertiser, you must complete Form 8. A candidate must may resubmit a financial statement to correct an error until the filing deadline. The clerk is, is required to make public a public a rep, report of which candidates filed financial statements and which did not. Sorry about that. <laughs> Next slide, please. Financial statements um, continued. So the appointment of an auditor by the candidate is, is mandatory if expenses or contributions exceed $10,000. Auditors must be licensed under the Public Accounting Act and uh, 
that campaign statements are public documents. Now I'm going to hand it over to Carol. To Hi, next uh, slide, please. I'm trying to put this through. Um, all right, can you, can you hear me? All right. So all contributions must be reported. The name of the con contributors who contribute more than $100 must be reported on the financial statement. The clerk is required to make financial statements available to the public in an electronic format of charge. The appointment of an auditor by the candidate is mandatory if expenses or contributions exceed $10,000. Again, an auditor must be licensed under um, the, I just repeated that, I'm sorry. Uh, so we're, <laughs> my apologies. Candidates can file their financial documents at any time after voting day to January 3rd, adjusted from December 31st, as it falls on a Saturday. So filing the financial campaign, financial statement ends the campaign period. This will make it easier for acclamations and campaigns where little or no expenses is incurred. Clerks will be required to report whether candidates have met their financial filing obligation and publish that report on the municipal website or in another electronic form. This needs to be done by April 30th in the case of a red irregular election or with 90 days of a by-election. Clerks can determine the conditions for the electronic filing of financial statements. Next slide, please. Okay, so the nomination fee is only refundable if the financial statement is filed on time. A candidate third party advertiser who misses the filing deadline may file within the 30 day grace period, provided a $500 late filing fee is paid to the municipality. A candidate who chooses to file within the 30 day grace period will be subject to both the $500 late filing fee as well as the loss of their nomination refund. A candidate third party advertiser may resubmit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline. Next slide, please. Now surpluses, we get a lot of questions on this. When filing the financial statement, a candidate or third party advertiser with a campaign surplus must pay the entire amount to the clerk. So prior to paying over any surplus funds to the clerk, a candidate or a third party advertiser is entitled to a refund of any contributions they or their spouse, if in the case of an, an individual, made to the campaign, not to anyone else. The amount that may be refunded is the lesser of the amount of the relevant contribution or the amount of the surplus. So the clerk is required to place surplus monies in trust for use by the candidate if they need it for a compliance audit. The clerk is also required to place surplus monies in trust for use by the third party advertiser if they need it for a compliance audit. If neither the candidate nor third party advertiser requires the funds for these purposes, it becomes the property of the municipality or school board. Next slide, please. So every council and school board must establish a compliance audit committee. Members of the compliance audit committee cannot be members of the council or school board, an employee, a candidate in the election, or a registered third party advertiser. The clerk is to review contributions and to prepare a report for consideration by the compliance audit com committee if a contributor appears to have exceeded any contribution limits. This process is related to reviewing contributions as reported on the financial statements as it is not connected to the compliance audit process. If it's apparent to the clerk that a contributor has exceeded one or more of the contribution limits, the clerk would report this to the committee, which would meet to determine whether to proceed with legal action. The legislation does not specify what details are to be provided in the report to the committee. Electors entitled to vote in an election may apply for a compliance audit even if the candidate has not filed a financial statement. The application must be in writing and set out the elector's reasons for why they believe the Municipal Elections Act has been contravened. The application must be submitted to the municipal clerk or the secretary of the school board within 90 days of the filing deadline. The Compliance Audit Committee will then consider the application and decide whether to retain an auditor to undertake a compliance audit 
of the candidate's financial return. Next slide, please. So the Compliance Audit Committee is required to provide brief written reasons for its decision. Compliance Audit Committee meetings are required to be open to the public, but the committee may deliberate in private. Electors can apply for a compliance audit of a third party advertiser campaign's finances. The minister has the authority to make a regulation setting up qualifications for compliance audit committee members. The written reasons for the committee's decisions shall be given to the candidate, the clerk with whom the candidate filed his or her nomination, the secretary of the local board, if it's applicable, and the applicant. If an audit occurs, the report must be circulated to the same individuals. So when the compliance audit committee considers the auditor's report, if the compliance audit determines that there, there has been an apparent contravention of the Municipal Elections Act, the committee will decide whether to proceed with legal actions. Decisions of the committee may be appealed to the Superior Court of Justice. And a person who believes that a candidate has contributed the Municipal Elections Act may proceed with legal action without having first obtained a compliance audit. Next slide, please. So an offense uh, described in the Municipal Election Act constitutes a corrupt practice and a person who commits it is on conviction disqualified from voting at an election until the next regular election has taken place after the election to which the offenses relates. That's in addition to being liable to any other penalty provided for in this act. So no person shall directly or indirectly offer, give, lend, or promise, or agree to give or lend any valuable consideration in connection with the exercise or non-exercise of an elector's vote. Advance, pay, or cause to be paid, money intending that it be used to commit an offense or knowing that it will be used to repay money used in that way. Give, procure, or promise, or agree to procure an office or employment in connection with the exercise or non-exercise of an elector's vote apply for, accept, or agree to accept any valuable consideration or office or employment in connection with the exercise or non-exercise of an elector's vote. And finally, give, procure, or promise, or agree to procure an office or employment to induce a person to become a candidate, refrain from becoming a candidate, or withdraw his or her candidacy. Next slide, please. So uh, please refer to the chart to understand the penalties for individuals, candidates, and third-party advertisers. You also note that in an ineligibility to vote is a penalty if you are convicted of a corrupt practice. I'm gonna hand over the next slide to Caitlin. Thank you, Carol. I'll be concluding the presentation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, voters list. So the preliminary list of electors as corrected by the clerk becomes the voters list on September 1st, 2022. The clerk determines how and when individuals can apply to have their name and information corrected or added to or removed from the voters list. The clerk can also remove a name from the list if the clerk becomes aware that the person has died. Section 23 of the Municipal Actions Act states that the clerk shall not provide a copy of the voters list under subsection three or a part of the voters list under subsection four until September 1st. Next slide, please. One copy of the voters list can be provided to each municipal candidate or trustee candidate. Requests must be made in made to the clerk in writing. Candidates running an award are entitled only to that portion of the list that contains the names of the electors entitled to a vote for the office, for that office. Copies of the voters list are not available before September 1st, 2022. The voters list should not be posted in a public place. The voters list should not be made available to the public by posting on an internet website or via any other print or electronic medium of mass communication. Third party advertisers are not eligible to receive a copy of the voters list. Candidates running an award are entitled only to that portion of the list that contains the names of the electors entitled to vote for that office. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. The clerk may require anyone who receives a copy of that list to sign a receipt acknowledging the list is only used for the election for election purposes and any other use would be in violation of the Municipal Elections Act. An elector's name shall appear only once on the list and in a ward system, an elector is entitled to vote only in the ward where he or she resides. Next slide, please. Voting proxy. There are a number of reasons why somebody, someone would appoint someone else to vote on their behalf, including absence from the area, illness, and et cetera. Um, for more information, please review sections um, 44 of the Municipal Elections Act, but here are some examples. So no appointments until a nomination are closed. Clerks may designate a place and time for presentation of proxy voting application and appointment forms for clerk certification. On days of advanced voting, the clerk office or another location may be designated and open from noon to 5 p.m. An assignment of proxy vote is the responsibility of an eligible of the of an of an eligible voter to appoint an identify eligible voter. Um, eligible proxies may exercise only one proxy vote unless the proxy is acting on behalf of a spouse, sibling, parent, child, grandparent, or grandchild. Proxy forms must have original signatures, and please check with the municipal clerk if proxy voting is available, as municipalities that use alternative voting may not permit voting proxy. Next slide, please. Thank you. Scrutineers, so only a candidate may appoint scrutineers to represent him or her during the voting and counting of votes, including during a, during a recount. Third party advertisers cannot appoint scrutineers in the traditional election where voting takes place at a poll. The deputy returning officer, DRO, is in charge of the activity in the voting place and the DRO may ask the scrutineer to leave if the scrutineer is not complying with the legislation. Candidates slash scrutineers should respect that the DRO must ensure fairness, access, privacy, and security of the vote. Next slide, please. Thank you. Recounts. A recount is automatic if the vote is tied. Council and councils and school boards have the option of establishing policies prior to the election that also allow for an automatic recount. Council still retains the option to pass a resolution for a recount within 30 days after the clerk has declared the results of of the election and an eligible elector can apply to the courts for recount within 30 days of the clerk's declaration of the results. Next slide, please. Um, this next slide is really important. Key dates, so voting day is October 24th of 2022 between 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. unless reduced hours are set out in a bylaw for retirement homes and institutions or council has passed a bylaw to open voting earlier than 10 a.m. The campaign period, the time when a candidate can accept contributions and incur election expenses runs from the date the nomination is submitted up until January 3rd of 2023. The campaign period, the time the third party advertiser can incur expenses begins on the date that their registration is certified. The earliest date is May 1st, 2022 until January 3rd, 2023. The deadline for the filing of the campaign financial statement in the clerk's office is Friday, March 31st of 2023, no later than 2 p.m. All candidates and third party advertisers must file the statement regardless of how much they spent or received in contributions. Next slide, please. Resources, so the first link will take you to the ELOS website where all provincial legislation is available online, including the associated regulations. You may want to be familiar with the Municipal Elections Act, the Municipal Act, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and if running for a school board, the Education Act. The second link is to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing website. From this site, you'll be able to access the voters list, the 2022 voters guide, candidates, and third party advertisers guide. Once on the Municipal World website, if you click on the icon, Bookshop, it illustrates a list of books that are related to running for a municipal office. They are available to purchase online. Next slide, please. Um, so this concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, please reach out to your municipal advisor, Jane Parnell, at Jane Parnell, at jane.parnell at ontario.ca. Uh, thank you for having us. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kim Wingrove, Creek County CAO. And I'd like to thank, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank Carol and Caitlin for providing such a tremendous amount of detailed information this evening. Um, I think everyone will be very appreciative to know that um, tonight's presentations, um, the questions and the answers that are discussed, as well as a recording of tonight's proceedings, will be made available for all of you on the um, elections page of each municipal website. So I hope that that 
will be an excellent resource for you because there was certainly a, a great deal of information covered there this evening. So thanks again, Carol and Caitlin, really appreciate that. Moving on in our agenda now, I'd like to um, introduce Anthony Fleming. Anthony is our account manager with the um, with MPAC and uh, a great resource and great friend to all of us. And we're looking forward to the information that you're going to share with us tonight, Anthony. So welcome. Hi, Kim. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, all the clerks and all the hard work you guys put together to get uh, to get to this point today. I know it's a lot of work getting um, something like this together. Um, I'd like to just uh, take a minute to introduce, uh, I have a colleague joining me tonight, Nicole LaFrance. Uh, Nicole will be in the background. If there's any questions, uh, Nicole can uh, definitely address uh, those questions. Uh, she might be trying to get onto the screen here, but uh, if she's not, then uh, uh, I could hi Nicole. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then if I could just start the uh, presentation, that'd be great. Great, thank you so much. And our friends at uh, Municipal uh, Housing and uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, gave us a lot of information and. Uh, People are probably wondering what does a municipal property assessment uh, corporation have to do with municipal elections? Um, so I will just go over a couple things about the municipal municipal property assessment corporation and what we do, as well as uh, as being elected uh, potentially elected officials in the municipality. You will get a lot of questions on assessment and assessment of properties, and I would just give you some information on the package that. Uh, on what to do if you if you have any concerns in regards to your assessment or anybody that's in the municipality or the great county at large if we go to the end also i, I just I, I must i must congratulate everybody on on the call today and thanking them for um you know getting their their hats in the political arena to help grow and shape the local municipalities and communities that they serve it is a huge undertaking and it is a it is a it's a big commitment and thank you for that uh, next slide, please. So I just thought I would just go over quickly about Ontario's property uh, property assessment and taxation system. Um, there are four key players in uh, Ontario's property assessment and taxation system. Um, first uh, is the Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance uh, really sets out the legislation that governs Ontario's property tax and assessment system. They do this through the Assessment Act, the, the Impact Act, the Municipal Act and the City of Toronto Act, which contains all the legislation and regulations. What does MPAC do um, for the property and its uh, taxation system? MPAC is one of the key players and our role is to determine the current assessment values for all properties in Ontario. MPAC is governed by a board, a 13 member board and is appointed by the Ministry of Finance and is comprised of seven municipal representatives, four property taxpayers representatives, two provincial government representatives, and the municipal representatives are appointed and based on nominations from the Association of the Municipalities of Ontario. Now, municipalities. Now, impact's role is also, before I get into municipalities, impact's role is also to classify uh, every property in Ontario, to assess and classify. We are experts in valuation, that's what we do. And we also sell products and services to banks, insurance companies, real estate professionals, just to name a few. Now the municipalities, they determine their budget and requirements and set tax rates and collect property taxes to pay the municipal services such as policing, fire, road, sidewalk, wastewater management, and municipal facilities to name a few. Municipalities in turn use impacts assessments and the tax rate that they, that they set and distribute the cost of the levy to their ratepayers. And finally is the property owners who pay the tax bill, as well as set the market values through property purchase and sale. So those are the four key players in the Ontario property taxation system. If we can go to the next slide, please. Now, Ontario property taxation system, uh, when, we regard, when we talk about assessments, uh, Ontario is, in a four, is typically in a four-year cycle. So every four years, we release new values out to the province. Um, we now have surpassed 5.5 million properties that we assess and classify in the province right now. So every four years, what we do is we assess those, and then properties um, are increased and phased in gradually over a four-year cycle. 
So uh, our last one was 2016. And then we were going to release our numbers and then all of a sudden COVID hit, COVID hit us. So we were scheduled to um, release our assessment values in uh, 2020, uh, but it was postponed. So for right now and for uh, property taxation years for 2022 and 2023, the assessment values are still classified as are, are still assessed based on evaluation date of January 1st, 2016. Uh, this means that the property assessments for 2021 property tax year is the same as it was for 2020 tax year, unless there was changes to the property. And what that means is that if there was a, a renovation or an addition to the property, there was a betterment or even a demolition to a particular property, then we would reflect those changes too as well. So we are always on the go of changing the values of the property when there's additions or demos on these properties. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So the 2020, 2021 Ontario Economic Outlook and Fiscal Review, the assessment update once again was postponed. Uh, property assessment values, as I mentioned earlier, for the 2022 and 2023 taxation years will still be continued on January 1st, 2016 assessed values. So that is the part of the, now we're still waiting uh, to hear from the province on when we will be, have a new evaluation date. And that is with the province at this point in time. And once we have that information, we'll be sharing it across the province. So it must be said that every time we do make a, a change or a new building does get built, we backdate that to what it would be as of January 1st, 2016. So it's very important as elected official that, you know, as you as you as you re reach out to your citizens and that, that just to let them know that one of the things that you want to ask them, uh, you know, if they do do have a concern with their assessment, is just ask them, could you have sold your property for that amount as of January first, two thousand sixteen? And if they say yes, then really the assessment is correct. So, relationship between property values and taxation. So municipalities do not generate additional tax revenue as a result of a reassessment. An increase in assessment value does not necessarily result in a higher property taxes. The most important factor is not how much assessed, the assessed value of a property has changed, but rather how the assessed value has changed relative to the average change in the class within a municipality. So for example, if, if all assessed values increase at the same rate, then there should be no change to the tax, taxation on your properties. But if the assessed value is lower than you, if your assessed value is lower than the average, then you would expect to see a decrease in your assess, in your taxation. But if your assessed value increase is higher than the average of, of, the, of your property tax, property class, then you would, uh, we would see an increase in the taxation for that particular property. And also uh, assessments change may also result in tax shifts between property classes. Uh, next slide, please. So once you have, uh, you know, your head around taxation and properties and how they're assessed and how taxation works, um, and then if your citizens decide that, okay, my assessment is still incorrect, and I want to just uh, take it to the next level. So what we have is a tool, and you can reach this tool. It's called Boat My Property. And boatmyproperty.ca can be leveraged off our impact.ca website. And then what you can do there is you can view your property, you can compare it to other assessments in your neighborhood, so other like properties. Uh, you can view, view details on how we assess property, uh, your particular property. And you can do a what is called a request for reconsideration, and it's a free service. And what you can do is just go in on about my property and just say, hey, you know what, Impact, here's some information. I've looked at a couple of neighbors' properties and I feel that my assessment is incorrect. What we'll do is we'll take all that information and we'll review your particular property and then give you a final statement on if the assessment would stay the same or if there'd be a change in your assessed value. And this is really a commitment from MPAC to ensure that all values are, are fair and all values are correct throughout the province. So if you can go to the next slide, please. And I, must, I mentioned this earlier, but I thought it'd be have a nice little graphic here for you so it'd be a nice little takeaway so that uh, you can see here as we move through this, step one is to ask yourself, could I have sold my property for the assessed value on January 1st, 2016? And if the answer is yes, then you know, then we would stop that you would stop the process there. If not, as I mentioned earlier, you could visit about my property, view the information that we have on file for you. And then step three 
would re review similar properties in your area and your neighborhood. And then step four would be take all that information for your discovery and go on to, uh, and you'll be on, on online with about my property at this point. And then you can actually fill out a request for reconsideration right online. It'll just capture all the information that you have had uh, during your discovery on about my property. And then it'll be sent off to us electronically. If uh, for some reason people are not computer savvy and they don't want to go online to review their property and whatnot, then you can actually get these forms uh, from our office or we can, you can call our office directly and I have some contact information there. And then what you can do is you can send the form in directly via a um, Canada, Canada Post and we'll review your property as well. So that's just a little bit about impact and what we do and how we fold into property assessments and just give you a little bit of information on, you know, when you become an elected official and there's questions out there in the municipality about assessment and taxation. Um, what can you do to try to resolve those concerns with your constituents? And also when you become an elected official within your uh, uh, respective municipalities, we will be hosting um, a series of MPAC 101 sessions with our, our municipal elected officials. Um, it's just a matter of just setting that up. We'll set that up through the municipality and we would go through in more depth and more detail on just those four slides. It would be like a 40, 40 slide presentation and it would take about an hour to get through all that information. So look forward to that as you become an elected official. I will see you probably in the early of 2023 and uh, presenting assessment 101 to you all. So what's our role in the upcoming municipal and school board election? So if we go to the next slide, please. So roles in enumeration and election process. There are four main components in Ontario's municipal and school board trustee election process, and each plays an important role. In Ontario, the municipal district, uh, in Ontario, municipal district school and service administration boards and school boards elections are held every four years, as we know, with the next election is in October of this year. Municipal, municipal school boards uh, voting rights in Ontario, uh, municipal and school board voting rights in Ontario are tied to the person's relationship to their property. And as we mentioned, as, as our friends at the Municipal Housing Affairs, you know, you have to be a resident in the area or, have, or you have to have property in the area to actually vote. So for example, if for myself, I have, I live in a one town, but I have a I can vote in this town, but I also have property in a in a in a uh, another municipality. It's a cottage, so I can vote in that area too as well. So persons who are Canadian citizens and are 18 years of age on the voting day and, and a potential elector in every municipality or jurisdiction where they own uh, property can vote. Empire plays a large uh, role in the municipal enumeration process as we provide both legislated and non-legislated deliverables and process and support municipalities, school boards and district services and administration boards through that process. One of the key products that we uh, provide is the preliminary list of electors and we call it the PLE and we send that out uh, to our municipal clerks um, on a uh, there's a couple of dates there, I won't get into the exact dates, but there's a couple of dates where the preliminary list of electors are sent to our municipal clerks. And then from there, the municipal clerks will go through the preliminary list of electors. And then from there, they will create the voters list. And next slide, please. So if you're out in and wanting to drum up people to get uh, on the voting list, um, just to ensure that people are out there, you're out there canvassing and campaigning, and you want to ensure that people can vote in your municipality, there are three ways to get enumerated. One is voterlookup.ca, and I do have a little slide on that later, and I'll explain a little bit more on that. Um, you can contact MPAC's, MPAC's customer contact center, customer care contact center, and I have the numbers here for you. Excuse me. Or you can actually go right directly to the municipal clerk and get put on get enumerated right from the uh, right from the office itself and next slide please so this is a just a little uh we've had these little um, buck slips that we've uh, posted all over municipal websites as well as that you might have seen these in papers uh, you might have seen these in news articles so what while we're working to implement the legislative changes that will transfer 
so just let me back up here. So MPAC has now been and has been creating the preliminary list of electors for the last uh, several elections. Um, but what we are is we are getting out of the business, as you say, and we are transferring that off to Ontario elections. So while we're working to implement legislative changes that will transfer this responsibility for the municipal list of electors to Elections Ontario in 2024, we're responsible for both the 2022 municipal election at this point in time and any by-elections that may, may arise in 2023. We are leveraging voterlookup.ca and PAC's online service to allow electors to confirm and update their information for municipal elections. We are also working closely with Elections Canada and Elections Ontario to sure, ensure that our current, our, our, ensure our currency of our data and the elections working group, uh, sorry, uh, get a little tongue tied here, uh, Ontario to ensure the currency of our data and an election working group to ensure that our strategies reflect the municipal needs. So we've been doing a lot of work in the background. We've got a lot of partners, municipal and from the federal, and not federal, provincial government that we've worked in conjunction to actually ensure that the preliminary list of electors is as clean as possible. And next slide, please. So I put a little slide in here just to show you what voter lookup looks like. I'm not sure if anybody in, on the call today has gone into voter lookup to view their information. Um, I have done it myself and it's pretty, quite simple and quite uh, easy to get in there. Um, you would just need your municipal uh, town, your first name, last name, and your birth date. Or if you know your street location and your roll number, assessment roll number, um, then you can actually do that and then it'll take you into the system. So late summer into uh, this year, uh, there will be a message that will appear on Voter Lookup directing the con to contact the municipal clerk as the municipal clerk would say, okay, I want my preliminary list of electors. So then we would shut down the actual Voter Lookup for that particular municipality. There would be a message there to contact the clerk's office directly to get yourself on the voters list. And each municipality has the, um, the ability um, to put a message on Voter Lookup and uh, where they want to share that information or what information they want to share on Voter Lookup. So is it a, is it a phone number, an email, or, or a, a link to a website to get more to get onto the voters list? So if you don't know your, uh, uh, if you don't know your, your roll number, you can call our contact center. They'll just screen you with a few, uh, um, few minor questions. Uh, just to prove your identity and they can give you that roll number if you want to go in that way or if you want to just put in your information uh, at the top of the screen um, you could do that as well um, at some point i just want to reiterate that some point in 2023 voter lookup will be taken down permanently when elections elections ontario takes over our responsibility in creating the uh, municipal uh, creating the elections lists and so forth for you so this is a nice little graphic just to show you what impact has been doing over the last uh, well since October of 2021 June to October of 2021. So this is just a little line a subway line we call it just to see where we're at right now so we've just finished March 31st so the deadline for board and poll changes. Um, that's done. So now we're in the, in the process now of getting information, getting every, everything into voter lookup, getting as much data as we can into our names database so that we can create a, a clean preliminary list of electors for our municipal clerks. Um, so once that is done, then we do it, what's called product canvassing, um, where we, we have a series of products that we share with our, with our clerks. And just to see when they want their when when they want particular products from MPAC, one being this preliminary list of electors. There's two dates there. One's in first of August, one's middle of August. So which ones do they want at those point point in time? Um, so we will deliver those products either August 2nd or August 21st. Usually it's the 31st of 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 the of July, but being that it is a, a holiday, so we push that out to August the first. Um, in September of 2022, uh, we will produce an exception file. So any anomalies that have came in between the those two dates, uh, we will provide that list to our municipal partners. And then the great day is uh, October 24th, 2022, is the election day where I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, nail biting and uh, 
um, uh, a lot of excitement uh, that will go on that night. And then um, on November 20, uh, 24th of 2022, we will uh, have the final voters list and revisions. Um, revisions are due and we will send that off to Elections Ontario. And lastly, I think the last slide is coming up. So any additional questions, uh, concerns uh, that you may have, there's my contact information. I am the account manager for uh, Gray and Bruce counties. So uh, my cell phone number is there. If you have any questions, you can contact me directly or bounce me an email. Um, or if you want to, you can call our contact center. Um, we've got a lot of opportunities here for you to reach out to impact in regards to municipal elections or any assessment concerns or questions you may have. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, on mute, Kim. There, thank you. Wonderful, Anthony. Thank you so much for all of that information. I think it's really helpful to everyone to understand the important role that MPAC plays in this in this whole process. So yes. appreciate thank you being you. here tonight. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Kim. It's my pleasure. Take care. At this point, now I think um, the next up on our agenda is Heather Morrison, the Gray County Clerk, who's going to talk to us a little bit about becoming a member of Gray County Council. Heather, thanks. Thank you, Kim. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Kim said, I'm the Heather Morrison. I'm the Clerk for Gray County. I'm just going to take you through a few slides on uh, what Gray County is, and if you're thinking of running for the mayor or the deputy mayor of your local municipality, uh, what you can expect as a member then of Gray County Council. If you go to the next slide, please, Tara. So what I'm gonna cover is just a little bit of information on uh, the different types of municipalities, how Gray County differs from its local municipalities, being a county councillor, what to expect, and some Gray County facts. So there are three distinct uh, municipalities in Ontario, upper tier, lower tier, and single tier. Gray County is an upper tier with nine lower tier municipalities within its borders. And Gray County works under the provincial uh, legislative framework, specifically the Municipal Act, Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, um, and along with a number of other uh, pieces of legislation. So just a map noting our nine municipalities within the county of Gray there. So how does Gray County differ from its local municipalities? We are an indirect election um, at Gray County. So if you are thinking of running for the mayor or the deputy mayor of your local municipality and you are successful in the election, you will automatically be a member of Gray County Council. So you will be elected to both the local council and Gray County Council. It is an indirect election based on your, uh, your election as mayor or deputy mayor. The head of council is the warden. They are elected annually and they are elected by the members of Gray County Council. Recorded votes are weighted at the council under the County of Gray Act of 1993. What recorded votes are, are one vote for every 1,000 electors or part thereof. The clerk from the county will receive the number of electors following each municipal election. So for an example, if a municipality has 5,900 electors, the two members, the mayor and the deputy mayor from that respective municipality will receive six weighted votes split equally between the mayor and deputy mayor. If the municipality has 9,500, they will receive 10 votes. Those that have an odd number of votes, say seven, the four votes will go to the mayor and three votes will go to the deputy mayor. Tax collection is done at the local level. So the local municipalities will be where you're getting your tax notices from. Tax policies are set at the county in coordination with the local municipal tax uh, treasurers. While there are some different, there are some similar services uh, both at the local municipality and at Gray County, there are some service differences as well. Roads, plannings, economic development, 
are all both at the upper and the lower tier municipality. Gray County is also responsible for administering several provincial programs, Ontario Works, social assistance, licensed childcare, social housing, paramedic services, Provincial Offenses Court, which we operate for both Gray and Bruce County. And we also operate three long-term care homes. There are differences in services provided from one county to another. For example, Bruce County provides library services, Simcoe County provides waste management, Dufferin County provides uh, policing. So what does being a county councillor mean? There are 18 members of Gray County Council, the member, the mayors and deputy mayors of each of our nine municipalities. When you are a county council, councillor, you are making decisions for the good of the county as a whole. It sets a bit of, um, you're elected at the local level and you're representing your local municipality on Gray County Council, but then you have to put on a county hat when you come here and make the decisions based on Gray County Council. Your decisions set policies and will guide your actions that impact the residents of Gray County. Council and committee of the whole meetings are held on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. They normally run from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. There are also additional task forces and subcommittees that meet monthly, quarterly, depending on their terms of reference. Some of those task forces are made up strictly of county council members. Others have public stakeholders that sit on those as well, such as our Economic Development Planning Advisory Committee or our Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee. Twenty eighteen, the Municipal Act change and allows our local local municipalities to appoint a councillor to act as an alternate in the absence of a member of county council from your municipality. So if the mayor or the deputy mayor are unable to attend a meeting, your alternate may attend. They are sworn in, they sign the same oath of office as you do as a county councillor, and they are an alternate. One alternate member may be appointed for the full length term of the council. They are paid a per diem for mileage for meetings that they attend and they are provided access to county council agenda packages, minutes, and reports for those. As I noted, um, we meet on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. We operate under a council and a committee of the whole structure. 10 a.m. starts Gray County Council, followed immediately by committee of the whole. Normally those are full day meetings running, the, running from 10 till four. The list below is at other committees and task forces, not an exhaustive list. Board of Health, Long-Term Care Committee of Management, Affordable Housing, Accessibility Advisory. We also have uh, an Agricultural Advisory Committee, Tourism and Economic Development. Changes made under the Municipal Act allow electronic participation to occur at county council and the committee level. It's something we're seeing regularly these days and I think we're all becoming experts in Zoom. Virtual participation through Zoom is an option for Gray County Council members as well as members of the public on any advisory subcommittee task forces as well as any delegations wishing to appear before a committee of the whole council or any of our subcommittees or task forces. Council members are compensated on a salary basis. This does cover uh, both council and committee of the whole. The current compensation rates for 2022 are listed there. Uh, they are members of OMERS, the pension plan. There are no other health or dental benefits, but they are part of our employee assistance program and can access those um, resources as needed. Mileage and per diems are provided for any additional meetings task forces, subcommittees, et cetera. So Gray County's population is over 100,000 residents now. We are the fifth largest county in the province of Ontario. 
We are the fourth largest geographical area. Our 2022 gross expenditures for operating and capital budgets is $186 million. And the average property owner pays just under $930 in county taxes annually. Gray County Facts, right now we have just over a thousand staff members on there. The largest workforce, long-term care. 565 people look after our residents in our three long-term care homes. We have 835 staff that are dedicated to serving at-risk people, long-term care, housing, social services, paramedic services. This just provides you with an overview of the 2022 budget. We have different sections for planning, healthcare, Ontario Works, affordable housing, long-term care, paramedics, transportation making up the largest piece of the budget and corporate services being our administration. Thank you very much for that. Again, our contact information will be at the end of the uh, session and we'll be able to answer questions after that. Thanks so much, Heather. That was a great summary of the, of the county operations. I think at this point in our agenda, um, we were going to go through um, some of the, the questions that people had submitted prior to or when they registered for tonight's session. Many of these, I think, have been answered through the presentations as well. Um, Caitlin and others have done a great job of uh, answering questions that were posted in the chat. And I just want to touch briefly on a, a couple of them. Um, I think there were early questions about uh, third party advertising. I believe all of those have been covered, as has the, um, the time frame for the, the campaign for the selection. Um, there was a question about uh, community groups who promote issues on social media, um, but not uh, directly endorsing a candidate being considered for third party advertisers. And I did note that that was in the presentation from Municipal Affairs, saying that if you weren't spending money on, um, on campaign advertising or, or promoting an individual candidate, um, that that was not considered third party advertising. Um, there were questions about the anticipated costs to run in an election. And um, I don't know if any of the clerks on the line want to comment on that. Certainly in my experience, um, I've seen candidates budgets go from zero <laughs> to the to the limit. So I don't know, Corinna, did you want to comment at all on that? That would be great. Sure, thanks, Kim. Um, I just wanted to make mention, I received that question as well. And, and I would suggest that the um, anyone wishing to run in the election, uh, they could per perhaps go to the municipal websites and, and look at what other candidates have spent um, in the last election to give an idea, as, as you may mention, uh, some candidates spend a lot and some within their limits, of course, and, and some um, are a, run a very lean campaign. So I would suggest that that would be a good place to go and, and uh, find some information from various municipalities actually to get that information. It's a great suggestion. And I'll keep you right on the screen, Corinna, because the, the next question was about when people can put yard signs up. And I think there's maybe two parts to the yard sign question. One is when can you put them up? And the next is where, where can they go? Right, uh, thanks, Kim. So um, further to that question as well, um, I would suggest that you speak to the municipal clerk to see what your sign bylaw says for the, your municipality. And here in the town of Blue Mountains, we limit when the signs can go up. Um, don't quote me, I think it's 45 days before election day, but um, we limit when the, the election signs can go up. So um, candidates must follow our sign by law. So um, I suggest that each candidate go to your clerk and, and find out what the restrictions are in your municipality. And further to that, you should also contact the county to see what the county um, allows as well as far as the placement of signs. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thank um, you. Another another interesting question uh, came up uh, with regard to um, 
a sitting member of council who happened to be appointed during the term of council and whether should that person decide that they wish to run for election this time, are they running for election or are they running for re-election? I don't know if anyone has a definitive answer on that tonight. Do you know, Corinna, or is that something we want to get back to people on? Um, so that was a question um, that was posed of us uh, some time ago as well, actually. And we did reach out to the ministry and re received a response from Jane Parnell. She's not here, but she could certainly uh, verify this information. So, um, so the question is, when a member of council has been appointed um, for the term of council, not elected, but appointed, can when they're running their candidacy for the next election, are they um, are they running to be reelected, or how, what can they? How can they um, announce their candidacy? I guess. So the response was from the ministry: the legislation does not regulate how a candidate presents their candidacy to the public. It's up to the candidate to decide whether that term appropriately represents their candidacy. So again, the legislation is silent on that. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, another question that came forward um, was about asking for clarity around conflict of interest for anyone running for council. Um, we know that um, each municipality has rules and procedures regarding the use of municipal resources during the campaign. Um, Certainly as, as staff, I know that we all try to be very careful to treat everyone um, equally and, and fairly, whether they happen to be a, a sitting member or someone who's running for election um, for the first time. But again, Corinna, any other points you'd like to add to that? Yeah. So I, I would want uh, more information on what exactly the person was speaking about, but I would just encourage them to familiarize themselves with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Mm -hmm. And um, if they have a concern, they should cer certainly um, get a legal opinion on that to make sure that they're, they're doing as they should. Exactly. And mm -hmm. as, we, as we tell all of our members of council, we add each time that it, it is important yeah. to, yeah. Get to, yeah. uh, to get that advice and guidance to help you make your decisions. Um, the last question that we had that was um, provided uh, ahead of uh, tonight's meeting had to do with the um, hours that someone could expect to work um, as an, an incoming elected official. And again, Corinna, do you want to give a sense there? Uh, certainly. So um, a number of municipalities have gone through a council compensation process. I know here in the town of Blue Mountains, we went through that process as well. And the councillors, they provided input as to how much time they spend um, in their, their councillor role, uh, mayor, deputy mayor, councillor role. And um, there was a report come forward um, out of that. So I, I believe a number of other municipalities have gone through the same um, uh, process. So I would, I would suggest that certainly the, um, a candidate speak to the clerk or maybe even speak, speak to a current counselor to find out exactly or a, a rough estimate of what your municipality, um, how, how many times they meet a month, how many times they meet a week, um, committee, that sort of thing. Um, keeping in mind that, that it can change to uh, the procedural bylaw um, dictates how often our meetings are. If a new council comes in and, and decides that no, we don't, we want to meet every week, twice a week versus maybe twice twice a month, that could change. But but it is good to become familiar and and be aware of of the time commitment. Thanks, Corinna. Now, as you say, there's council meetings, there's committee meetings, there's your own personal preparation, getting ready for meetings and reviewing agenda packages. There's special events. And, and then there's the part that we as staff don't see, which is the time that you spend responding to your constituents and answering their questions and, and trying to help them as well. So That's right. there, there are a lot of parts to this. Um, one of the questions that was raised in the chat um, had to do with access to um, mailing addresses. And I'm gonna call on um, Raylene, Clerk Raylene Martel from Gray Highlands. Uh, I think, really, did you have a comment on that, please? Hi, 
Hi, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so in the 2018 election, we had this question posed to us, and we actually got a legal opinion. And the legal opinion just kind of basically laid out what is in the Municipal Elections Act. So section 23 of the Municipal Elections Act actually provides the information about the voters list. Um, 23.3 says that copies of the voters list are to go to the minister and the clerk of an up all those people that needs to be due uh, needs to uh, have the list. However, the part that goes for candidates actually says specifically on the written request, the clerk shall provide him or her with the part of the voters list that contains the names of the electors who are entitled to vote for that office. So when we had our legal opinion, um, our lawyer had said that it is very clear the fact that it is separate from the voters list itself and it specifically lays out the part of the voters list and it does not say that the candidates are entitled to the part of the voters list that contains the names of the electors and their addresses so um, they were very clear that it was the part of the voters list that contains the names of the electors i appreciate you being able to share that with us tonight really and thank you very much um, I see a further question in the chat um, that we could address. Can you run for council if a member of your family works for the municipality that you're running for? I believe that the answer to that is yes, you may. However, there may be times, um, should you be elected, there may be times that uh, you would be looking to declare a conflict um, depending on the matters that were before council. I don't know if any of the clerks want to add anything further to that. Okay. All right. Um, I think that then brings us to the end of our agenda tonight. And so on behalf of, of all of us here as staff and, and our friends from MPAC and Municipal Affairs and Housing, I really want to thank you all for making the time to be here and for your interest in public service and holding elected office. It's so important that our communities have committed caring people who are willing to stand for election and take on the great responsibility of making decisions on behalf of their fellow residents. I know that we've provided an awful lot of information to you this evening and some of it was um, fairly complex, but again, as staff, as your, as your clerks, uh, I think everyone's very willing to um, assist you, to be able to direct you and to answer your questions as you go through the process. I wish you all every success in, um, in, your, in your campaigns. And again, thank you so very much for being here this evening. So thank you, we Kim. Do just, we do just have a, a contact list uh, coming up for clerks. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out to um, your local clerk. As Kim said, they are an abundance of information. This information, as we said, will be posted on each um, of our member municipalities' websites on the elections page. Thanks again for being here, everyone. Good night.